my name is Martin Majewski uh, and first I will show you a short presentation about myself uh, and say a few things about what I do actually as a chemist in general and what I do in my uh, research. Uh, so, as I said, my name is Marcin Majewski. Um, I'm currently a postdoc, so I'm doing a, a kind of fellowship after a PhD in the group of Harry Anderson here at the Department of Chemistry in Oxford. And uh, just to show you shortly uh, about my research about myself, let's start where I'm from. I'm actually from Poland, from the city of Wrocław, which is the largest city in southwestern Poland born and raised there and completed uh, most of st most steps of my education and uh, moved to Oxford about two years ago to do my fellowship. Um, and just to show you a brief um, a plethora of things that you that I can do, uh, maybe it's easier just to show them, uh, show them as pictures. Uh, so of course, as a chemist, I do experiments and I do, uh, do them both in a research setting and also uh, in an outreach setting. So I do uh, show things, show simple experiments to the public to um, get their uh, engagement in chemistry. Uh, as a chemist, you also uh, travel for conferences to hear scientific talks, to collaborate with people and to get new collaboration this way. But also you have a lot of social bonding. You have usually work in uh, international groups or highly international groups. Um, and you, um, you can um, bind with them both inside and outside of the lab. A few snapshots. And in terms of my chemistry, uh, I'm an organic chemist and I do molecules called microcycles. As the name says, these are um, some molecules consisting, like cyclic molecules consisting of smaller subunits. Uh, they are pretty large on the molecular scale, of course, and there are a few different reasons why I make them. First, I want to see how they interact with magnetic fields, uh, depending on their strength and, and so on. Uh, I also want to check how they absorb, so take in and emit uh, light, different kinds of light, and how this uh, there's a correlation between their structure and the kind of light, light they interact with. Uh, and these are some pictures of my uh, of my molecules that actually emit under UV light. I also explore some host gas interactions, uh, which are the kind of interactions in between the hole and the microcycle, which is like a cavity. Uh, and you can think that some uh, some smaller molecules can go inside uh, and interact in some way with my uh, my molecules. And this sounds pretty abstract, but actually all of these things have a very practical meaning because, uh, for example, the magnetic fields are used and the manipulation of magnetic fields is very uh, important in magnetic memories, uh, MRI scans and so on. Uh, host gas interactions are the basis of any kind of molecular sensor or chemical sensor, and all the uh, phenomena um, associated with absorbing or emitting light uh, is the principle uh, behind all kinds of dyes, pigments, also the ones you have in functional materials, um, solar cells and display screens like your phone. Uh, once you have this research, of course, you publish it. You usually publish it in specialized, uh, so, well, general chemistry at least, um, journals that can be read by the scientific community and reviewed. Uh, but occasionally you also get to uh, do interviews uh, to bring your science to a broader audience. Uh, and currently I'm working um, to make microcycles containing porphyrins. And what are actually porphyrins? Well, first of all, these are one of the building blocks of life. So you can find them both in plants, in chlorophyll, uh, and in animals, in our blood, in the chem. Uh, so these are small building blocks, which I can incorporate into larger structures. Uh, they in themselves also have some catalytic activity, so they are um, regarded as functional materials themselves, but also can be used in medicine, uh, for example, in photodynamic therapy. And Currently, as a postdoc, I'm making nano rings, so the kind of larger microcycles, as I told you, consisting of four friends. And I'm actually uh, in the group. Uh, there are different shapes and sizes investigated and with different templates. So let's think of it as a mold to hold the structure together. Um, and we use porphyrin as the building blocks. And the key thing that a lot of organic chemists do is actually to investigate the stru structure versus property relationships in the systems to see 
uh, what kind of interesting phenomena we can uh, actually observe. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention for the first part. Uh, looking for your for your questions. This is a, a most recent group photo. Um, of course, for some time we have been working in a, a bit different environment th uh, these days. Um, and of course, I am here because of the European funding that I'm also thankful. Thank you for. Uh, and now I'm guess uh, it's time for some questions. OK, so we have our first question, uh, which is, are your molecules used in medicine too? So in principle, porphyrins, as, as the building blocks of what I do, are used in medicine. So they are used, well, they are biologic, uh, biological materials, really. Um, but they can be both isolated from, from organisms, but more uh, commonly, they can be made just synthetically in the lab. The ones I'm using are not meant to be put in living organisms, mostly because they wouldn't just penetrate our uh, the, the cells, and actually that some of them might be uh, carcinogenic, so it would be the other way around. But some of them would be used, uh, some of the porphyrins can be used in this photodynamic therapy, for example, so they can be um, injected to us. There are smaller ones that actually can be um, inside our uh, our bodies and then by shining light you can actually uh, kill cancer so that's one of the reasons to do it now we're actually some of us in the group are working at incorporating this kind of larger cyclic structures uh, in biological functions and first thing to to do is to make them soluble in water because we are made of water uh, and living cells are made of water so you need to make them uh, water soluble which most of them are not but we're working on it OK. Any other questions? OK, I have a second one. Uh, so the second question is, I will just publish it now. Uh, you talked about structure and function. How do you find out what happens when you change the structure? Very good question. Mm, with a very long answer. Uh, well, the short, short answer is we have a variety of different techniques to probe our molecules. So uh, it can be anything from direct imaging. So we have, um, we can use microscopes, but not the typical light microscopes, but um, microscopes using uh, electrons as the, uh, the source of the radiation. And you can visualize your molecules on the surface, for example. So we can probe the structure like that. Uh, mostly we deal with solution based methods. So we try to dissolve our molecules because we make them in solution. We also dissolve them in different um, solvents. And then we have uh, different kinds of methods uh, called spectroscopy, which means the, the, the name actually suggests that it's interaction with different uh, electromagnetic radiation. So we have different kinds of um, method in which you like radiate your sample and it gives back some kind of a signal that can tell you a bit about the function. Uh, so in terms of like how it responds to light, for example, if that's what we're interested in. If we're interested in uh, how it um, responds to like magnetic fields, which is also a pretty common because this is the way also to know how they are built. We, um, we also then put it in a magnetic field and try to see the response. So there's very different techniques. You can do an electric field if you want to see how it responds to electricity. Uh, and you can also add in like different molecules and see how they interact with each other, how their state changes, how their properties change. Um, it's a very broad question, so we have a follow up one. I'm happy to answer as well. OK, next one. Why did you decide to go to Oxford? Uh, well, the easiest answer would be because it's a world class uh, research facility. Um, but my personal answer is a bit longer. Uh, I did know 
the professor that, I, that I'm collaborating with beforehand. I met him at conferences and I have seen his work before. Um, and at some point he had a position here for a, um, for a fellowship, which I applied for. Uh, funnily enough, I didn't get that position. Uh, although I did present my own research, the one that I did before on my PhD, and the, uh, my professor was interested enough that he said that we should like write up a proposal for my own research and then get funding for it. And that, that's how, uh, how it happened. So I actually got um, external funding and then a year later uh, came in here as a Mercury Fellow. So it was a bit by chance, but a bit by conscious choice by just knowing who does what in my field. OK, and next one. Huh. What will you make next? I'm guessing like in the lab, what, what kind of molecules uh, will I make next? So there are a few different paths that you can take. First of all, we want to make bigger molecules, so with the larger the rings with larger diameter, because there are some theoretical predictions that some effects might be observable, some uh, properties might be observable only in this medium range rings, mesoscopic rings really, uh, which are not yet achievable. So we are working towards making just larger rings, but also um, to connect rings in different, how it's professionally called topologies. So if you can, uh, if you imagine that you can connect two rings like in a chain, that's one way to, uh, to make a new molecule and just to see how what, what that does, or, or to stack the rings one on top of the other and then create a tube and see how, or have an, a canal and see what what kind of properties does it have. Can it like transport more molecules? Can it arrange in some kind of porous material and so on? So it's mostly about making either larger, more complex structures from these rings or just making larger rings and see how they behave. Okay, so next one, uh, which is here. So are conferences an important part of a career in science? Definitely, definitely. Uh, you would think that the major uh, part of my work is just doing experiments in a lab, and that's true. But at some point you need to write up your material, you need to publish it, and then you get some limited response to it. You get some reviews, you get some comments in social media and so on. But that's not all. A lot of the inspiration and follow up work and collaborations come from uh, live meetings, just chats on coffee breaks, on conferences and so on. So conferences are not only about um, watching the talks. That's one thing to, to get like a good sense what's happening in the field. What are people really interested in? but also to get this kind of connections, to ask follow up questions to, to the research you see, which you cannot just make when you read the paper and you think like, how was it done? Or like, what's the issue here? Uh, you can ask these questions live. So that, that's very important uh, conferences. Uh, plus you also see a bit of the world. You do see sometimes a bit of different cultures and different working styles. You often see how different labs work, which also gives you a nice inspiration for your own research. OK. I see questions are coming. That's good. OK, and there's a question about what. Once again, what sort of properties might you see in these bigger rings? Uh, for example, it has been observed in like really large microscopic rings. So the ones that just made from metal that you can see under a microscope. That if you apply certain amount of a magnetic field to them, you induce an electric current. So they try, they start to um, conduct electricity around the ring. And it seems that if you manipulate the magnetic field, this current can actually flip to the other way. So it can go, let's say, clockwise. And if you flip the magnetic current, it can go anti-clockwise. And it's predicted that this thing could be observed in in pretty large rings, uh, but molecular ones. But the thing is, you need to make them because in smaller rings you would need so large magnetic fields that we cannot really make them. So one of one of the goals in making more uh, larger nanorings is see how they behave in magnetic fields and can we 
induce this flip of current, which is actually any kind of changing the electronic state is very important in all kinds of electronics. If you think of like transistors, what you have in your uh, memories, you need something that can switch from an off to on state, from a zero to one. And one of the ways you make that is to flip current from one way to the other. Um, so that's one thing. And of course, we want to see how we want to see some trends, some correlations in between what's the uh, like what's the progression in light absorption when you go from smaller to larger rings and to do this kind of uh, more statistical uh, investigations, you just need a wide variety of different rings. I hope that answered the question. Okay, next one. Uh, what is your lab like? <laughs> also quite general. Uh, so if you mean the uh, the group or the place, the, the buildings in general, organic chemistry does involve quite a lot of specialized equipment uh, and uh, quite a lot of supporting structures that make your work efficient on one side, but also safe. So for us, it's absolutely compulsory that we wear uh, lab coats, we wear safety goggles, and we have fume hoods that um, separate us from the the chemicals that we're working with. So that's one thing. So in, in the, the lab setup is actually pretty, pretty advanced, pretty clean, although not as clean as like an electronics lab where you need a complete clean room and you work in special suits and so on. So we're not on that level, but we also need something in between. We need some level of protection. Uh, and of course, we need to have all the chemicals, glassware and everything else organized in a way uh, we have like different modules for different equipment, so it is pretty complicated even for chemists, even for trained organic chemists. Uh, every time starting work in a new lab is a challenge. Every lab is organized in a different way. The people are organized in a different way. The workflow is different. Uh, also, size of the groups are different. So now I'm working in a, let's say, medium sized group, which is around 20 people. That's medium size for, for a research group. You can have groups much smaller, like five people, and much larger, like 50 people. Uh, and then it's a completely different work work dynamic. Uh, if if this uh, question requires some detail, more detailed answer, then please do uh, make a follow up. OK. You said about traveling for conferences. Where would you like to go? Which scientists would you like to meet? Very nice question. Uh, well, in terms of traveling, I actually really like travel in general. It's my hobby. I do it both in my professional life and in my free time. Whenever I have the occasion uh, and the funds, I would I really like to spend my money on, on traveling. Uh, in terms of conferences, I was lucky enough to participate in a few uh, worldwide. So I was on a few in Europe, in different countries, but also in Japan and the US. Uh, there was one conference last year that was unfortunately cancelled that would, would have been held in in Australia, in Sydney. So that would be a really nice place to go. Uh, I would also love to go more to the US and Asia to uh, to see some different countries and or at least different cities that held the conferences. Um, in terms of the scientists I would like to meet, well, of course, always you want to meet the current and still living uh, Nobel Prize winners. So that's and they do give lectures in large conferences. You can see a Nobel Prize winner uh, giving a, a key lecture. I have seen uh, one or two, yeah, two Nobel Prize winner lectures. So that's always a very inspiring thing because these are scientists that are on the top of the field uh, and really know. Um, and in my field, I always want to go to large conferences, well-known conferences where they gather all the best of the best in my own field. So to be um, to see in person the people I only read about. So I read papers. That's a part of your training is to read scientific papers. Um, and uh, sometimes it's really nice to confront the papers and the, the science that's written with the science that someone can present to you. And then you can like have the backstory and also the follow up questions and so on. So you always go to conferences that you're interested in. You should go to these kind of conferences where you just want to hear about the research and the story that's behind it. 
OK. Next question. I oh, now I need to scroll. OK, you mentioned current in rings. What this would this allow very small electronic devices like computers and phones? You're exactly right. That's one of the main reasons in this like revived interest interest in the different kinds of not only microcyclic molecules, but this the the idea that you can make electronics on a molecular scale. That's a whole field and it's it branches chemistry, physics, material chemistry um, and engineering, of course. So a lot of thought is is put into uh, making devices that would be so small that they require atom like manipulation. So it's definitely one of the key fields that are developed now that you want to make things smaller and with classical electronics, the ones the most of the, the one that we currently use, uh, you cannot go much smaller than we are currently at the limit because of some effects that are not classical. So the effects that are not governed by the kind of principles that were applied when designing these kind of things, but some, for example, quantum physics come into play. So these are so small things that you see these weird effects that now make, make it harder and harder to miniaturize stuff. And well, the bottom line is that maybe we should just use like single molecules or single atoms to uh, to do these functions. And that's one of the, the reasons that we also make really defined molecular uh, architectures. Um, and we actually, in terms of like the, the, the rings, we do, for example, put them on surface and just try to probe them how they conduct electricity in like different places. Or we also make tapes, so this kind of linear uh, oligomers, and we also like put electrodes on both sides on the molecular level and, and um, try to measure the conductance and see if they can we can use them, for example, as logic gates in, uh, in electronics. OK. OK, so we have a follow up question. Uh, thank you for your answer about the lab. We are interested in the equipment, but it made sense about the people too. Thank you. So yeah, the, the equipment is well, we have. A lot of different equipment that some of it is part of the research group. So we have a lot of things to both make our molecules and separate them because a lot of work is also put in separating mixtures that you get out of reactions and to characterize them. But a lot of equipment is actually shared in the whole department because it's very large and very expensive and needs a lot of maintenance. So we use this kind of collaborative approach. Sometimes we also send our samples somewhere else, different cities, different universities, different countries. Uh, with and then we work with our collaborators to uh, investigate some of the properties that we just don't have the equipment to do. OK. Next one, what do you think is common to Nobel Prize winners? Why are they so successful in their work? That's a great question and of course everybody would like to answer what, what do you need to do to get a Nobel Prize? But there is a common theme that's among most of them. They always say that it's always a combination of their passion to what they do. You need to really love what you do. Uh, the time you spent on it, because it's not enough to, to like love something, you need to like really work hard on it. And some luck. And because there are a lot of groundbreaking discoveries that started from something very insignificant or something that was just made by chance. So you need to in in making research, you need to always be very creative, but also very um, uh, watchful on the, the kind of results that you get. That sometimes the results you didn't expect is the most interesting one and actually it can follow up to some some great discoveries. So I would say that it's always a combination of good ideas, passion for it, work, and a bit of luck. And of course you need to have the people to, to uh, conduct the research with. Nowadays, the times of single scientists who 
can discover new elements or new molecules or new laws of physics or, or laws of nature in general are gone. Most of research is done in groups, smaller or larger groups, sometimes hundreds or thousands of people uh, contribute to one major discovery. So collaboration is nowadays more important than ever. OK. What is your favorite molecule? Hmm. I don't think I have one favorite, uh, although I always just like and always will like the molecules that I made at first. So the first things I published, the kind of microcycles that I made during my PhD on my first paper, these are the ones that will always stick out in my memory as my like first public achievement in the field. Uh, and it got like some nice, I got some nice feedback out of it. Uh, I did a good paper, which I'm proud of. So I think that's uh, that's one thing. And but also in organic chemistry, especially you have a lot of uh, molecules that are just aesthetically pleasing. They are very, it's very symmetrical. They are very like nice to look at. You can make pretty drawings out of it and so on. They make great posters. Uh, so uh, the, the aesthetic part of, uh, of of my work is also sometimes uh, pretty inspiring that you can think of how to make it like look nicer, but it often means that it actually uh, you change the properties and sometimes the properties are even more important. OK. Do you like chemistry? I am in primary school and I like chemistry. Uh, and because my teachers like playing with fire. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I wouldn't at least like what I'm doing, and in many days I love what I'm doing, um, I wouldn't be in a place I am now. So I I started in chemistry by just being interested in, in the world. It's especially if you're in primary school, but on all stages of life, it's more about like be, being curious about things, how things work, why they work like that or maybe in different field how people behave and uh, how a different uh, different things can be explained and then you in chemistry you think like how how does that how the observations we make then um, translate into the theories we know in chemistry and about like how the molecules are connected with each other and what they can do uh, in terms of flame fire everybody likes a good a good flame uh, which is also part of chemistry, although usually uh, now and nowadays you really don't want to have any kind of fires uh, in your lab, but in like outreach when I uh, try to show some interesting experiments to to uh, students. It's always good time, so like color changes, flames, flashes and so on are always the, the selling point of these kind of things. OK. What are the important questions of chemistry uh, stated by the Chemistry National Association? Huh. Mm, of course, we want to think as chemistry as one of the like, principal sciences. It's one of the the longest established scientists like uh, sciences uh, out there in terms of like a, a whole set of tools that are designed to to, to investigate it. Uh, so it is in all the possible fields. So of course, you cannot be great at everything. So in my case, we want to, uh, we really want to advance material chemistry. So we want to make things that, um, we want to answer questions about how molecules, uh, like what's, what's really underlying the principle and some of the theories we have is, is, is these are just models or can, can you go deeper and have like a more general view. So one thing is to have as general as possible ways of explaining everything that's hap that happens in this universe. So how molecules interact. Of course, one of the big questions is the chemistry of life, how life was created, how it uh, and then how it got successful, why here, why on this planet? So that's also, and, and it's also a very multidisciplinary thing that you combine astrophysics with chemistry, biology, and so on to, to try to answer these questions. 
So origins of life, but also making our life better on every day, I guess, are two large topics that you can think of. So and in my case, it's just materials chemistry. So the kind of materials that you can use, the, the functions that you can utilize to, to make our, our life better, more, uh, oh, one more large, large field is uh, making things, making processes that are more environmentally friendly. So that's, of course, a big topic nowadays to think of what's called green chemistry. So everything, the processes that we know in industry and in, in life, and make them more sustainable, more uh, or less uh, polluting in general. Okay. Do you ever make molecules you don't expect to make? Uh, sure. More often than not, they are useless. So you make molecules that uh, you have a plan to make something and you usually start with reading some literature. So you read what people have done in the field. Then you come up with a pathway to do it, a rational one based on the knowledge you have, and you consult it with, with some specialist, with your supervisor or whatever. And then you try to make it. And more often than not, you fail at some step. Usually this kind of um, this kind of uh, investigations involve multiple steps, so doing smaller molecules and then combining them to, to make larger ones. And the smaller ones even can be surprisingly non-cooperative, so they it just can be uh, uh, not working as you want. But sometimes, especially when you're like towards the goal, the kind of like rearrangements you can have, the kind of uh, unexpected chemistry you can see, sometimes make it actually more interesting. So we want to describe, you want to investigate the the unexpected result than just what you what you thought would be the, the right result. And it does happen to me as well. I had a few um, a few projects in which, like the what became the main topic of my paper, was actually a completely random discovery of the of one of the properties of the molecules. And then, of course, it was traced back to uh, a structural change. So uh, something that I did not anticipate when I thought about the project. Yeah, it does happen quite a lot. OK, I think I answered all the questions for now, so please do ask more or some follow up ones. Because they were pretty diverse. Well, we have a new one. How do you cope with your fail? How do you keep going? Excellent question. Um, first of all, you well, you learn it the hard way. Um, failure in science and all kinds of science where you're pushing the boundaries of unknown. It the price for it is often failure. And you you re, you really need to be like motivated from the start, for example, to uh, to pursue to try something different. Uh, you always should have a plan B. So when you design a molecule, you should always think, OK, but if this doesn't work, what 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 can we do differently to make it work? Or how can we change the project into a direction that will work? Or what kind of like maybe we should make like a different molecules if we're interested in this particular property. So these are the questions that you ask yourself every day, and it's a very dynamic uh, working environment like when I do experiments, I am not 100% sure what I will do next week or next month or next year, because this is based on the, the results I will have this week and this month and this year. So it's often about being flexible in your research, sometimes about stepping back to, to like examine really what happened or to, uh, to, to, to show it to someone else from your group, maybe he has a better idea. We often discuss our both results, positive and negative, on group meetings. So that's that's very important to, to get feedback because often uh, people around you will have better ideas than you on this particular problem, so you can solve it. Uh, and also have parallel, parallel projects. So you want to have 
a few different things going on, a few different projects. And there's like a larger chance that one of them will work out. So I guess that's the when you when you're running a group, that's I guess the, the main solution to be successful is to have a diverse set of people doing diverse set of uh, projects because some of them will fail, but some of them at the end will work. OK, next one. If you weren't a chemist, what would you be? So. Um, when I was in high school, I was in a classical uh, a kind of profiled class, uh, profiled on chemistry, biology, physics. And like the natural next step for a lot of my friends was to go to medicine. So I also thought about becoming a doctor or becoming a pharmacist, but more about making the uh, the, chem the, the, the medicine that we take. Uh, and in general, I was like always interested in natural sciences. So maybe if I would just by chance be more motivated to like go into biology, maybe I would I would go that way uh, or more in physics. So it's I always wanted to like explore the world. Maybe I could be a traveler just that would be like a dream job as well just to travel and I don't know have a blog or something that would be amazing. But you also need to have the right uh, right timing for it, right motivation and uh, and still a lot of hard work. Um, yeah, so it's really hard to say what I would do if not this, but I'm pretty sure it would be something about discovering the, the things around me, the world around me. OK. What was the best advice you had when you were younger? Hmm. Mm. When I started my my research, when I love was on my master's level, so I was after after my bachelor's uh, degree, I started to do real research. And at that time, my supervisor told me that that you should try very different things and do not get discouraged very uh, very soon. So I guess that would be a. a that was a really good advice to just not get discouraged and try different things because only then you can uh, you cannot lose the motivation. That was uh, a really good advice. Uh, and in school I had a, actually uh, a lot of luck in having uh, very inspirational teachers uh, and a lot of them just just the way they, uh, they they conducted their classes, the way they taught me different things and they pushed me uh, to to develop myself in different subjects. Uh, I guess that so it wasn't that much of what they said, but what they did um, make me a better a better person, a better scientist. Okay. you want any details for the answers I have given you, then please, please do comment. OK, so I have a question. Will you stay in Oxford or will you go to the US? Huh. Um, I'm not sure if these are like the only two options you can have. Uh, but it seems like uh, I am finishing my fellowship here, so it was from the start, it was a fixed term uh, thing. I knew that I will come here for two years and I'm actually finishing uh, very soon. Um, and the next step is, was, is actually going back to my home country because I did get an academic position there in my old university. So I will be uh, both an academic teacher and a researcher. So I will uh, teach students, which I really like. Actually, I do like I, I do uh, like um, giving knowledge to others, but also I will conduct my own research as part of a larger research group. In terms of the US, I for sure I want to go there for both for travel in my private time, but also for many conferences to come uh, once we can travel more freely. OK, next one. Did the pandemic make a difference to your work in the lab apart from masks? Yeah, of course it did. Uh, so masks is one thing, but First of all, of course, during lockdown, 
we couldn't go to work. And some chemists can work from home. Theoretical chemists, there's a lot of chemistry done in silica, so on computers where you simulate things and that can be done from home. But as you can imagine, being an organic chemist like I am, you cannot do any experiments at home. You can plan things, you can uh, write up the data you have, you can analyze the data. But uh, since I could, could not do the experiments during the lockdowns, of course, then it was like a setback, just a time setback that I couldn't do much at home. And then we started, when we started to work, we actually had to uh, work in a social distance manner. So we were working in shifts, we were working part time. So mostly it disrupted our, our schedules that we didn't, we couldn't devote as much as time as possible. And often chemistry requires, like practical chemistry requires you to be flexible in your time. So on one day you will need four or five hours to, to, to do an experiment and the other day it requires 10 hours. So it's not really a nine to five job, which then it makes it hard when you do have a strict amount of hours because of the restrictions. But now we're back to more or less to normal. So apart from masks, uh, we can work more or less like we did before. And of course, the well, the, 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 the lack of working on site meant that we had much less connection with the other group members. So it was we had like uh, group meetings on teams and so on and uh, like discussions also online, but we couldn't have like a proper discussions on, on an everyday basis with most of the group. OK. What's the best thing about your work? What's the worst? Um, in many ways, this is about academic research in general. The best thing is that you have, in terms of the research, you have total freedom. Of course, you are constrained on some level by the funding you get, by the place you are in, but in the general sense, whatever you're interested in, you can try to go into that direction. You can switch fields, you can collaborate with different from people from, with, with people from different fields. Uh, you can change projects, you can completely flip your your research and it it is done by established scientists. People uh, can move continents. There are professors who after 30 years in one place, they just move their group to a different continent. So it, it gives you a lot of freedom and especially in fundamental sciences, you're not that bound by um, by the, the, the constraints that are uh, connected to applicability. So it's not that you need to think if, if you don't make a device from what you make, uh, it is just rubbish. No, you need to like you're more uh, in the job to do like research to figure out how things work and not to just commercialize them. So that's that's an upside of, of research. The worst thing, um, I guess, well, the, sometimes the frustration that comes from failure, that's that is a big thing. And of course, the crazy working hours that you can have, although it often depends on you how much you want to devote yourself. So you need to watch out. I guess that's a real danger for a lot of scientists not to be burned out too quickly. So to balance your life in a way that's comfortable for you to balance your work and everything that's apart from your work uh, to the level that you are comfortable with and both have a life and have a successful career. OK. You said you were going to work in a university. Would you ever go to work for a company? Uh, who knows, actually? Uh, I have been looking into industrial positions. I have applied. I actually got one position, uh, which at some point I, uh, I just turned down because it wasn't exactly what I wanted. Uh, but I also have like uh, I did an, a fellowship in a company uh, or like an internship, uh, a summer internship somewhere in between. So I have seen a bit of that side and sometimes we also have collaborators that are experts in different companies. So they're employed in companies. So I see a bit of that side. And for myself, yeah, I would see my uh, I, I would see myself doing like working in a company, but still I think working in the kind of research and development that's done. So if I would work in a company, it would be still a company that 
works in on like the cutting edge of science or cutting edge of technology uh, where I would still like could use my skills and my knowledge to, to discover things that that would be the type of company I could work with in. OK. Anyone else? There was a lot of really good questions. Some hopefully I could I did answer most of them correctly. OK, we have one more. Thank you for your answers. You mentioned chemistry is very creative. It doesn't seem like that at school. Well. That's a problem, I guess, of in, in all fields that to be creative, you need to know some kind of boundaries or some or the, the abilities that you can have in a given field. So being creative in arts means completely diff a different thing than being creative in sciences. On some level, on, on, a, on another level, it's actually the same because uh, as an artist, for example, you still need to know your technical skills. You need to, apart from the imagination, you need to know how to uh, take what you have in your mind and then make something out of it. So the same is in chemistry. To, to be creative, you need to know the basics and this is well this stems from uh, from history that chemistry is such an established science there's a lot of to, to take in as basic knowledge to then go out of that that uh, that field so if you think that being creative is making new things that no one has done before so first you need to know what has done what has been done before and secondly, how to make this kind of things. So unfortunately, a lot of it is also linked to knowing the basics of physics, of math, um, and you can't really do chemistry without it, at least some kinds of chemistry. If you like don't doing experiment, don't like doing experiments, you can be a theoretical chemistry. If you don't like physics at all, uh, you can go to like biological chemistry and then have collaborations for the like physics related stuff. So this flexible, but you do need to have your basis to like have an idea really what's going on in the field and then to understand the papers you, you're reading as well. OK. On a completely different note, what is your favorite part of Oxford? Uh, well, Oxford is an amazing city in general. It's, it's so historic and so uh, connected with the university. I mean, everywhere you look, uh, you see colleges, you see university buildings, you see uh, some commemoratives of famous people that lived and work here. So I really love the atmosphere and I really liked uh, the great architecture that you have here, which is actually one of my hobbies, uh, architecture. So I really do enjoy uh, just living in this kind of setting. It's also a very green city uh, and pretty sizable, so usually you, you can go by bike almost anywhere or by public transport. Uh, so it's actually also pretty, pretty pleasant to uh, to live in and just like have a walk around the, the center or the parks. OK, what are you hoping to achieve in your new position? OK. So when you when you're starting your more or less independent career like I am now, you need to uh, find an idea for a project, which in general I have, and then you need to get the funding for it. So my my first task when I come back will be first of all to settle in in my new position to see like what are the, the arrangements, settle in my group, uh, get funding for my, for my research. So think about what I want to do more, de more in detail, then get funding and then do some preliminary work to see if my ideas are valid and also to get collaborators to do it um, as well as to start to do teaching to uh, have students and uh, and see how that goes and how how to make myself a better teacher actually 
Okay, how much time do you have for hobbies, traveling and architecture, for example? Um, hmm. As my work is pretty flexible, uh, you can enjoy quite a lot of free time if you plan it well. So, for example, that's also one of the, the uh, Main, main reasons I really like working in academia is that you have quite a lot of vacation time. Um, not only in the summer, but in general, you have quite a lot of days that you can take uh, a leave, a holiday leave. So you can, if you plan it correctly, you can travel quite a lot. Um, and flexible working just gives you this opportunity to just plan plan everything at once so you can you can adjust your work to your hobbies and you can adjust your hobbies to your work. So it's always it's it's just much easier than when you have like a strict nine to five job where you go to the office and you need to be there at this hour and leave at this hour. Uh, in my case, I can be much more flexible about it. And of course, it is a lot of work, especially in this kind of top institutions that I am uh, I am in now. You need to work. Uh, quite a lot to achieve something, but it's not like you need to work your whole life like that. Uh, usually you just want to, well, at the start of your career, you want to um, learn as much as possible and gain as much as, uh, as much as opportunities as possible. And then you can like establish yourself uh, and by the collaborations also ease, ease yourself a bit in like different tasks that you need to do. Um, and then you can, you always, could have some time for hobbies. It always depends on you. For some people, their work is their hobby uh, in academia. So people are so passionate about what they do, they, they don't need almost anything else. But most of us have hobbies because like for me, my hobbies make me more sane. So make me more also less prone to, to burning out because I always have something that's completely unrelated to my work to go to when I have a bad day, for example. Okay. So I think we have time for one or two more questions. So please do ask them. Oh, we have one more. Who is your favorite chemist? Hmm. I don't think I have just one favorite chemist. Of course, as as a chemist and as a person from Poland, I would always say that Marie Curie Skłodowska was one of the greatest scientists in, in history. Uh, in terms of both being a woman scientist and she achieved amazing things, especially in these times in that position. But in general, she uh, like could combine science with um, working for the benefit of people. So that I really like. But also, well, you have a lot of different scientists that you look up to, also a lot of different chemists. So uh, of course, a lot of people that get the Nobel Prize are, are heroes in terms of the, the kind of world changing research they do, but it's not like you have one person. Most of us don't have just one idol that we look up to, but we look at the top figures in our, in our community. OK. Any last questions? Oh, we have some. You mentioned you didn't do medicine, but chemistry. Why did you choose chemistry? Uh, OK, so at some point I realized that I am interested in like in sciences and I am I might be might be interested in medicine, but I wasn't actually that keen on working with. How to say it with people that are not professionals, so I was just more drawn into working like in my everyday professional life to working with other professionals. And medicine requires mostly working on on patients, on on just random people, random people, people who just are in need. Um, 
and it does require a very specific because I have some friends that are doctors. It requires a very specific mindset, very specific to make it a, a, a driving force for a successful career. And if you just don't have it, you, it's really hard to make yourself be a good doctor and actually you shouldn't usually do it. It's a great profession, very prestigious one, uh, that can be very interesting, but you need to have the right mindset to do that. And also, of course, when as time went by, I discovered that I like making new stuff. I like teaching as well, and just an academic career in chemistry lets me uh, lets me combine uh, the kind of qualities I, I'm searching in life in a better way than medicine would do. OK, one more question. How do you balance research and teaching? A very valid one. So in terms of teaching you on the different positions, you do have a certain amount of teaching to do per year, for example. Uh, and this is more or less set in the calendar because this is based on how the students have their classes. So you need to just make time for that. And the research is done in all the time that's left out from that. Because as I told you, a lot of research is more flexible. So you can do, let's say, a bit of teaching in the morning, then come, come to the lab and do your research, and then maybe do a bit of more teaching. So usually it's, it's designed, the whole career is designed in a way that you're not overwhelmed with one or the other. So you always have a certain amount of teaching, but it's not like five days per week, um, usually. And also, well, you need to steer your research in the way that it wouldn't be too time consuming because you are required to do, usually you're, you are required to do both. In some institutes, you can only do research, and in some universities, you can be only a, a purely uh, a, in, on a teaching position, so do only teaching. But most of positions require you to balance these two things. So on on the teaching side, you usually have have it capped in terms of the time, um, the, the amount of hours you need to spend on it. But in terms of the research, it's up to you to how how much you want to spend, how much time you want to spend. OK, I think that was our last question. I think time is up. Well, thank you for all the questions. Some of them were really interesting and hopefully I could answer them as best as possible.